Alex, yeah. um, I don't know how you do it. Like, we're convinced there are Alex Glastin clones. <laughs> who are, like, there's another one back at home working on a book right now where you're here. Well, I don't know how you do it, man, but um, another fantastic book. Congratulations. We covered this topic before, but we, me and Danny said, now the book's out. It'd be good to cover it again. Mm -hmm. Also wanted to bring Natalie in because me and Natalie have had a couple of great interviews, and we just think her understanding of geopolitics as well mm -hmm. would add to this conversation. But... Um, Let's do a, like a t almost like a TLDR because we did the previous interview. We'll have it in the show notes so people can check it out. But mm -hmm. tell people what this book's about. Yeah, so obviously when you start looking at Bitcoin, uh, you start looking at the world a little differently. You start asking different questions. And one of the big questions that people don't ask traditionally about the international monetary system is, is, is basically very much at all about the IMF and World Bank, which is weird. Meaning there isn't like a Michael Lewis style, big short style book about the IMF or World Bank. There's no curiosity culturally in them. Um, they're not very approachable subjects. And yet they're probably two of the most important financial systems or institutions in the world. And when the US and its allies created the Bretton Woods system in 1944, they were two of the pillar organizations that the world was built on. So for me, you know, I, I just started digging around last summer a little bit because people were like, you know, slipping me things here and there about the IMF. And I'm like, is this true? Is this, could this really be true? And, and I had seen that they were involved in the French monetary colonialism uh, that I'd studied and, and written about and spoken about because the IMF basically was a tool that France used to, to devalue currency and kind of restrict these economies in Africa. So I dove in and I just, I couldn't believe what I started to, to, to read about when I, found all these old JSTOR articles. I would go and read uh, Courtesy Sci-Hub. There's this amazing Kazakh communist woman who runs this website called Sci-Hub where you can get free access to all the world's academic articles, which are normally behind these crazy paywalls. So please donate to her. Yeah. You can donate Bitcoin to her. You can't, Absolutely. You can't use fiat because they close it down. <laughs> but it's, uh, no, it's amazing. You read like about there's like great pieces from like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s that are just buried and people have forgotten. But there's vivid details about what the IMF and World Bank did and and, and continue to do. And that's why the book is called Hidden Repression is because the, the repression is hidden. And I guess just the, the zoom out TLDR would be that I think that um, it's true that Western societies, the US, UK and its allies have been successful because of our values. This is entirely true for sure free speech, private property, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. There's all kinds of cultural productivity stuff. Um, it's true, we, we, we should be proud of those things. But what people don't talk about or don't know about is that we've also been successful because we've stolen a lot of resources and labor from poor countries. And that's just like left out of the history books. You just don't read about that. And it's especially left out of the economics history books. So this, that, that's kind of like a simple way of explaining kind of the book in a nutshell um and we, we can go from there but that's that's kind of the jarring reality is, is is that we 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 rely on exploiting um poorer nations and that's just kind of a very uncomfortable truth and whilst these are in international institutions how much are they really american institutions oh very much so i mean look again the u.s um won the discussion at bretton woods in new hampshire at the very beautiful hotel that I've been at. Uh, and uh, they, they, they out-muscled Keynes and the British and all the other delegates and they got their way. The others wanted to have this uh, internationally managed kind of basket of different currencies to be the international uh, trade settlement uh, medium. And, and we said, no, it's gonna be dollars backed by gold. Um, and, 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 and we got to have the IMF and World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C. They're not somewhere else. They're right there in D.C. They're connected, which shows you how close the two organizations are. Um, and, and they were originally set up to be the lender of last resort for the world's financial system. I mean, these are reasonable things. And, and, and then a development bank to pay for things that private capital didn't want to fund in war-torn countries. And for the first few decades, that's what they did. And, and you know what? Like, I think even in a sound money standard, these could exist, like countries could pull together resources, you know, to put out a fire in case something goes wrong in a country. Um, at the beginning, they, they were created to, to stabilize exchange rates. At least the IMF was, the job was if a country like Britain, for example, or France fell out of its balance of payments um, and, 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 and couldn't afford to, to import anymore. Um, and 
and, and basically went bankrupt. The, the IMF existed to go in and stabilize that country because the goal of Bretton Woods was to make sure that the 1930s didn't happen again in terms of a breakdown in global trade. Like the spice must flow was like the mm -hmm. idea, right? That's why they exist. They, these neoliberal institutions that, that were created were, were meant to keep global trade going. And um, at the beginning, that's what they did. They helped Western countries recover from World War II. They, they would step in and stabilize, and it, usually an advanced economy when it, when it started to have a problem. Um, and the World Bank would like fund infra in, you know, infrastructure in Japan and Europe, basically. And I don't think there was like malice necessarily there. And, and they did um, do what they, you know, what they were promised to do. The problem is that in, when Nixon took us off the gold standard, um, all these economists were like, why, why do we need the IMF anymore? I mean, it was supposed to stabilize exchange rates, but we're no longer pegged to anything. So why do we need it? So what ends up happening, in, in, at least in my thesis, is that the bank and the fund pivoted like late 60s, early 70s um, from stabilizing and helping the rich countries get back on their feet to targeting and exploiting poor countries. And this is, this is like a transition that happens at the end of colonialism. Like colonialism is, is ending in, in around 1960. Uh, it's basically declared extinct at that time. There's like a couple countries that persist, but basically like you had this conveyor belt of cheap resources and goods coming into the heart of the Western economic uh, empire, Britain for centuries, you know, colonial, colon, I mean, and going back even further, I think about the conquistadors. I mean, what were these empires doing? What was colonialism really all about? It was about going to get the gold and cheap stuff from elsewhere to input into the British and French economies, for example, uh, to raise quality of life at home in London or Paris. I mean, that's what colonialism was all about. And, and the amount of stuff they looted from India was just unbelievable. I mean, a lot of British people don't understand how much British civilization is thanks to things stolen from India. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, India was the richest country in the world and it was reduced to like basically a subject of this small island in, in the North Sea, it's unreal. So um, that started to break down. And like when you have a breakdown in a conveyor belt of cheap labor and resources, you start to have economic problems. So that's one major reason why the Great Depression happened. That's something I advance in the book uh, off the back of uh, some interesting thinkers is that um, one of the reasons we had the Great Depression and so much economic trouble is because the, the colonial flow started to like basically trickle and, and stop. Um, you could say the same thing about the 1970s. Uh, one of the reasons we had so much inflation in the United States is because we lost control over energy. Like energy used to be controlled by Western companies through the Seven Sisters, Western corporations. Um, because of the end of colonialism, we had to give up control over energy production to these countries that actually owned the oil, OPEC. And they decided to raise the cost, right? So the end of colonialism meant, meant uh, more inflation here, economic crisis here. You're almost seeing like another wave of that now where like globalization's breaking down, right? And you're gonna see economic crises in the West. So this is history rhymes, right? Um, but basically my thesis is that you have this colonial drain dynamic that's been very, very lucrative for Western countries. And the, we figured out how to replicate that without the worship and the sword and the bayonet. We figured out how to do it with debt. And that's what we started to do with the IMF and World Bank. They're not the only actors in the system, but they're very, very important. And I just, I'll finish with this before we get Natalie's thoughts on this, but I think a lot of... Um, People on the left have been like criticizing the IMF for a long time. You know, confessions have been economic hitman, shock doctrine, there were tons of conferences and movements in the 80s and 90s. Like they were mainly Marxist leftist folks, um, but there's some libertarian criticism too that's really good in the 90s. The problem with, with, with a lot of this criticism is it basically says the IMF and World Bank are like wasteful, cor corrupt, bureaucratic, um, waste of taxpayer money, and, and they hurt poor countries. This is all true. But they miss, I think the biggest thing is that they're incredibly beneficial for us, the West. It's not just that like they're inefficient or corrupt or that they hurt poor countries, that's true. But they benefit us and they do that in three ways. Interest payments, like they make billions of year off interest. Like rich countries give money to the IMF and World Bank and then that money is deployed at a very high cost. Like so, there's a spread, there's a cancel on effect basically. State level loan sharks. Absolute predatory lending is number one. Number two is the, is the cheap resources and, and labor I described. I mean, basically uh, you get um, all kinds of minerals, uh, fossil fuels, uh, timber, uh, 
cheap agricultural products. And then you also get like deflated labor, meaning the labor in these countries, the, the wages are, are brought down by IMF policies. So to just give you an idea, in 2015, there was a study done where it's estimated that about 50% of all of the resources we consume in the West are from global South countries and thir about 30% of the labor. So just think about it this way. What if we woke up tomorrow and we had half the resources and we ha and our and the cheapest end of our labor spectrum was gone, meaning like the cheapest one third of the labor that we use to make our stuff and push our societies forward every day was gone. We'd have massive fucking inflation. So you have, that, that's the idea is like the, the, we, we rely on these countries to subsidize our way of life. And then the third way it's lucrative is control. I mean, we get political control over these countries and we engineer them so that they're dependent on us. This is done mainly through agriculture. Like Africa imports 85% of its food. It should be exporting food. It should be a net exporter. But basically what we do is in the West, we highly subsidize our agriculture so that, you know, you know, we end up exporting food and then we withhold that food if a country misbehaves. This is, we've done this many times. So we want it to be food sovereign. So we like change the rules of international trade uh, and, and we subsidize industries to crowd out these third world countries. So they end up having to basically uh, do monocrop agriculture and, and raw materials exports to earn dollars so they can pay back their debt. And, and this, is, this is the whole thesis is that, uh, you know, these institutions are not just harmful for poor countries, that they're very, very beneficial for us. Natalie, we um, we recorded a show based on an article you wrote, the refounding of the American dream. Yeah. And we covered a lot of the collapse in the values and the almost corruption within the US politics. But I wonder if there are the parallels that are exactly, I mean, there's exact parallels between what's happened within the US government and what's happening within these institutions. It almost feels like it's the same incentive models yeah. which have become aligned. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I loved Alex's um, historical summary. Um, there's uh, another dimension to that, which is that after the Second World War, um, the United States foreign policy was um, completely consumed by the fight against communism. And so our rebuilding efforts um, for allied countries and the so-called third world was always packaged as how can we fight communism by providing this aid? And so like USAID, the primary government-led aid organization was actually set up to fund anti-communist um, activity, politicians um, in countries that um, say weren't the res recipients of like fully interest-free loans, like the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. which we basically, we gave that to our friends but yeah. if, you, if you weren't in the inner circle, then you got loans or you got USAID, which was in effect military aid um, for anti-communist factions, but under the, under the guise of philanthropy. Um, and so we, we subsidized the um, economic growth of countries around the world in two ways. Um, or more than two ways. One is, you know, through the establishment of these international lending institutions. Um, one is through uh, direct aid, USAID, and another is through the balance of trade. Um, so the United States chose to actually run a structural deficit vis-a-vis -vis many of the countries that we wanted to recruit as allies in the Cold War so that they could begin earning dollars and build up an economy. But we didn't do this equally or evenly or with some kind of consistent application of principles. And so to Alex's point, you know, we have some industries that we just sacrificed in the United States, like manufacturing. Like we basically gave that to other countries. Other industries like agriculture, we have protected very mm -hmm. je jealously and vociferously. And so we've kind of picked and chosen winners. The other, the other element to this international uh, lending structure is that by the late 1970s, you had an overclass of hyper-wealthy individuals um, in, in many countries around the world, but particularly in the Gulf as a result of the growing oil wealth. And if you have, you know, billions of dollars, you can't just park that in cash. Like, you have to find 
financial institutions and vehicles who are able to securitize that for you and create investment contracts so that that money is making money for you um, so that you're not, you know, precarious. And as we were talking about with Lynn and Jeff the other day, there literally isn't enough, like, cash collateral in the world if if everybody wanted to redeem Mm -hmm. their balances. And so these lending programs were established in part through some of the sovereign wealth that was generated by resource-rich countries who, yeah, they were doing dollar recycling by, you know, uh, plugging some of that back into the U.S. economy, but they literally couldn't do it with all of their money. They had so much money. And so some of that went to these international lending institutions Mm -hmm. who then had to deploy that capital. And so how do they do that? Well, by creating loans. Well, the rich countries don't need loans. The poor countries need loans. Yeah. Um, and so there is a class element to this as well, where the wealthiest people in the world are constantly in search of safe places to park all their capital in a way that's going to return capital. Every, you know, every wealthy family has a hedge fund or multiple hedge funds. Um, and that has created a, a fully striated economic system 